Today we're talking eight players that are priest-level bust-proof in fantasy football this year. Maybe not the highest ceilings, but dudes you can depend on, dudes you feel good about. Do you, know, you go to Walmart, and maybe they're not the best brand of every type of asset, but you feel damn good about getting that value on these guys, all right? So we're talking eight dudes that will not bust for you in fantasy football this year. Some of y'all don't know what's going on in fantasy football, right? It's fucking the last day of August, the first six days of September, and you're like, I didn't look at a damn thing this entire summer. Just give me guys that won't make me look like a fool. That's what this list is. Y'all know what we got to do. I'm motivated. I am now tucked. I'm ready to talk some ball we'll start off with a quarterback there's one quarterback on this list that i feel real good is undervalued but wrongfully so and that's kirk cousins out in minnesota okay he's been good for like six straight years you can go draft a guy like jared goff or Geno Smith, which I'm not against. I, I would be completely fine with either of those guys as my QB1 in a regular league, my QB2 in a super flex league. I don't really care. But they have both had a very large sample size of being bad in fantasy football, whereas Kirk Cousins has pretty much put up an incredible run of really, really good, if not just above average fantasy seasons for like eight straight years, okay? He has thrown for over 4,100 yards in seven of the last eight seasons. And this is the crazy stat here. He has thrown more than 25 passing touchdowns in eight straight seasons. Okay? 25-plus passing touchdowns in eight straight seasons. There is not another active QB in the NFL that has done that. You look at his pass attempt numbers over the last four years in Minnesota. 444, starting back in 2019. 444. Next year, 526. The next year, 561. The next year, 643. Completely literally going up. Okay? Why do you think that is? Because they've had coaching changes that have gone more pass heavy. Their personnel, their players, the weapons around him have started to become more pass friendly weaponry as well as the NFL. It's just the way the NFL is working nowadays. You don't want to run the ball as much. And now there's no more Dalvin Cook. They draft Jordan Addison with their first round pick. They've got TJ Hawkinson coming in for a full summer, for a full season, man. It's a beautiful beautiful trio there of pass catchers, okay? And you also look at their defense. They were second in the NFL last year in run defense. In terms of their grade per PFF, they were 18th in coverage. That is what we call a funnel defense. This defense is going to allow a lot of passing, probably a lot of points. They're not going to allow teams to run the ball, which means less time is taken off the clock. And then on the flip side, they're going to throw the ball a lot because of this, all right? They allowed 25.4 points per game to opponents last year, third most in the NFL. Again, Bad D, lots of points, lots of shootout, a lot of throwing, a lot of Kirk Cousins, a lot of going over 25 passing touchdowns again, a lot of yardage coming, a lot of points to your fantasy team. Kirk Cousins is bust proof, and I think he's got some underrated upside as well. This guy, this next guy, while I think most people think of as an upside guy with some bust ability to him, right, with that C cup, D cup bust ability, I disagree. Ramondre Stevenson feels as much of a sure thing to me as any player that's going in the back of the second through the third round in fantasy drafts right now. If there was any semblance of competition in that Patriots backfield, I'd be a little nervous. If he had a Ramondre on his ass, right, like the rookie season that Ramondre Stevenson had, 625 yards, five touchdowns, super efficient, not huge in volume, but you're like, okay, this guy's kind of good. He might chip into the work a little more. If we had, if Ramondre had a Ramondre, I'd be a little bit more nervous. You have fucking Ty Montgomery, whose season high in rushing yards dating back to 2019, four years, is 103. I'm not talking about 103 rushes in a season. I'm talking about season high of rushing yards is 103 yards. But time on to pass catcher, okay? In that span, his season high in receiving yards is 95. Just stop. Just stop with the bull. Honestly, he'll probably get cut. Pierre Strong had 17 touches last year. Kevin Harris had 18 touches last year. So Stevenson, he's not going to get all the work there in New England, but he's going to get as much as he can humanely handle last year he was third in targets amongst running backs fourth in receptions amongst running backs and here's the other thing too like when you look at his splits in split is games in which Damian Harris played out of split is games in which Damian Harris did not play it didn't matter in games where Damian Harris played he saw over 17 opportunities in games that he did not play he saw over 18 and a half opportunities and there is not anywhere near the Damian Harris level of a player or at least that the New England coaching staff feels trust in like Damian Harris in the backfield right now. So if you don't think Ramondre Stevenson is going to average 18 and a half opportunities for game, you're a moron. 
Do I need to remind you that every single player that's competing with Ramondre Stevenson this year was also on the roster last year? If you combine all of these guys, all of them, their average touch per game total between all of them was three touches per game. Four running backs averaged a total of three touches per game. This is a new offense that it can't get any worse than last year. Stop. Ramondre is not he's not going to bust. He is he is one of the safer picks that keeps getting labeled because people weren't as high on him coming into the NFL. We've seen enough of a sample size to know that Ramondre Stevenson is going to be problematic for people playing against him in fantasy football. Third guy up on this list is David Montgomery of the Detroit Lions. I've talked a lot about him in recent weeks and how I'm very much in on David Montgomery, especially at his price right now, which is like at the 6-7 turn, right? Detroit brought him in at a pretty big deal, three years, $18 million. They obviously drafted uh, Jameer Gibbs with the 12th overall pick. Here's the thing, though. Th- their roles are so clearly defined. David Montgomery is coming in to take that Jamal Williams role. And you look at this tweet from Hayden. Jameer Gibbs had four carries inside the five-yard line and 10 carries with two or fewer yards to go for a first down last year. As someone who is a top-12 pick in the NFL, you'd think he'd probably get a little bit more volume there if any team was ever going to use him in those situations. Jamal Williams led the NFL in red zone carries, in 10-zone carries, in goal line carries, and in rushing touchdowns last year. David Montgomery has finished as an RB2 or better in fantasy in all four seasons of his NFL career. Detroit the situation is going to is probably the best of his career. It's a good offense. They have a good offensive line. That's something uh, David Montgomery never really had while in Chicago. And I think the other thing here uh, to just note is like David Montgomery is a much better player on a carry by carry, reception by perception, just play by play basis than Jamal Williams was for as good as he was last year for fantasy. Dave Montgomery is better at avoiding tackles. His juke rate is really high yards after contact per attempt. Yards perception, cap rate, all that, all, all that shit is just way better than Jamal Williams is. So David Montgomery feels extremely safe to me to get 220 touches this year and get uh, a ton of goal line work there in Detroit. That was a top five scoring offense last year. Number four, you want to talk about good offenses? Let's talk about the Cincinnati Bengals. T. Higgins feels like he is bust proof in this offense. Again, I don't necessarily love the upside there. There are other guys probably going around the same spot that I might think about going over if I'm someone who's Uh, less risk averse and I just want to shoot for upside but T Higgins is about as consistent of a player in fantasy as you're going to find when it comes to the end of season statistics and everybody wants to talk about consistency in the offseason they're like oh he finishes the wide receiver 12 when you get closer to the season everybody wants to look at individual you can't predict what's going to happen on a week by week basis so if a guy is going to finish as the wide receiver 14 he's going to finish there and over the course of the season keep him in your lineup and you will get wide receiver 14 worth of points now obviously there are outliers like Mike Evans last year and Joe Mixon last year where they have like one game that buoys. But for the most part, everybody is a little bit inconsistent in fantasy football. So shut the fuck up and draft T. Higgins where he's going if you want the wide receiver 11, 12, 13, 14 in finish. He feels a lot like Nick Chubb of the wide receiver position in the fact that like, you know what he's probably going to get like touch and yardage wise. And then his actual fantasy finish is going to depend on whether or not he scores a lot of touchdowns, okay? So you look at T. Higgins, and he's never really been a touchdown scorer. You look at his actual game logs, and they have been scary identical, right? Like targets, 108, 110, 109. Three years in the NFL. Reception, 67, 74, 74. His yardage has been anywhere from 900 to about 1,100. Touchdown totals, 6, 6, 7. And I know people want to, like, nitpick and say, like, oh, he missed two games in 2021. Last year, you know, Jamar Chase missed five games. So, of course, you know, things like that are going to fluctuate. But for the most part, you, you kind of have a good predictability of where T. Higgins is going to finish. And I do think, like, the good part about Higgins, like I said with Nick Chubb, is Chubb's had these – big explosion touchdown years that have gotten him to the top five or six fantasy finishes for the running back position with T Higgins being attached to like if he was in the Washington offense right I, Sam Howell's not going to throw for 38 touchdowns this year Joe Burrow's most likely going to throw for 35 if he has a good year maybe he gets in like the 40 to 42 range that's going to brush off onto T Higgins and that means he could probably have a high touchdown upside year not predicting it but it's going to happen one of these years so T Higgins feels like a really really nice floor player to give you 75 catches 1,100 yards, seven touchdowns with touchdown upside being in a good offense. Let's move to another good offense and another good wide receiver, aging veteran Keenan Allen. A lot of people are often, they think like the age cliff is here for him. If you think he's going to get hurt or some shit, cool. But I don't know. I, I think a lot of players get written off for being hurt and where people do this 
wrongly is like when they come back and they play really well still, I'm kind of past it. But when they come back and they play shitty again, I don't like to try to rechase the prime. When we look at Keenan Allen, what he did last year, when he returned from the injury, week 11 through wild card weekend, which is a nine game sample size last year, he averaged 11 targets, 7.3 catches, 82 receiving yards, and scored four times. That is 14 and a half half PPR points. That's like over 18, 19 full PPR points. I could see hit the end of his career being like Larry Fitz at the end of his career, where like he started kind of like uh, going down and everyone's like, oh, he might be done. And then his career got resurrected with Carson Palmer there. And he went for three straight seasons of 100 catches. He went for three straight seasons over 1,000 yards. Like was really, really productive in PPR type seasons. I think we're going to get that from Keenan. Now, obviously they had Quentin Johnson, but those guys, him and Mike Williams are going to be the dudes on the outside while Keenan Allen finally just mans the slot and gets high volume targets, high volume coverage. Like it's going to be a beautiful, beautiful thing out there in Los Angeles. And listen, I mentioned Terry McLaurin, but he's actually on this list where I'm a little bit nervous about about the quarterback situation, but he's done it every single year with the same quarterback situation. He is simply too talented to fail. And similar to T. Higgins, when you look at his year-by-year statistics, they are eerily similar. And they're not too dissimilar from T. Higgins. Now, Howell is definitely a question mark. They did play one game together last year. It was the last game of the season. Terry went 3-for-74 and a touchdown in that game. So we saw a little bit of a spark there. Let's see if they can turn the electrocuted electricity up come next year last year terry mclaurin's catchable target rate 72 and a half percent ranked 70th among wide receivers his yards per target ranked seventh so his catchable target rate 70th yards per target seventh do you understand how hard it is to make up that gap when you can't even catch half the fucking pass thrown your way that's how good this man is okay his catchable target rate over the last three seasons amongst wide receivers 70th 70th 77th it can't get much worse for this man he's been playing with Carson Wentz Taylor Heineke Alex Smith Dwayne Haskins Kyle Allen Case Keenum like I love Terry at his per- we're finally kind of like valuing him where he'll probably finish but he's got upside because he's talented and Sam Howell might actually be kind of good and if he's not good if Sam Howell's not good Jacoby Brissett comes in and we saw how Jacoby Brissett absolutely peppered the shit out of his number one guy Amari Cooper last year and Amari Cooper is the next guy up on this list my transitions are flawless today Amari Cooper the Cleveland Browns one I just want to say he did really well Jacoby Brissett and then he did poorly with Deshaun Watson just shut your mouth about Deshaun Watson not being a better QB for fantasy for Amari Cooper than Jacoby Brissett like not a single person in their heart believes Jacoby Brissett is actually better than Deshaun Watson it's just the dumbest fuck like fantasy people that play fantasy football are so blinded by numbers sometimes that like common sense literally just fucking flies out the window all right and we're just not letting that happen this year they have the full offseason now to work together and we know that Watson will actually be the starting quarterback this year. Last year, Mark Cooper had a career high in both targets and touchdowns. There are real weapons here, no doubt about it. Elijah Moore, DPJ, David Njoku, Nick Chubb getting a bunch of carries, Deshaun Watson carrying the ball. But that also means they're going to be a good, good offense. Their line is really good. They should sustain drives and have a high volume of plays there in Cleveland. I think they're going to be a lot more pass heavy with Deshaun Watson being more comfortable under center. I love Cooper here, too. Like, if you could start your drafts off with, like, Cooper Cup or Tyree Kill really early on uh, in the second round, get your your RB1, whether it's, you know, Chubb or Saquon or JT or whatever guys fall back into the middle second, end of the second round, and then at the 3-4 turn, you got, like, Amari Cooper and Terry McLaurin, you're out here living. You are out here living. You're not dying. TJ Hawkinson's career is not dying any longer because he's no longer in Detroit, and we are going to mash up Kirk Cousins with his tight end TJ Hawkinson as the last player on this list he gets traded halfway through the season his season with the Vikings in 2022 14.9 points per game a 22 percent target share a 25 percent target per route run rate 83 percent route participation which excludes week 18 because he rested but does include the wild card game. So we got a little picky there. But anyways, we look at Kirk Cousins in Minnesota. I've already talked about how I think that that offense is going to be much higher volume in passing. It, there's no reason not to be with Dalvin Cook out and Hawk and Jefferson and Addison there as the weapons. But you look at what Kirk did, you know, go back to Washington with Jordan Reed. Why can't Hawk be Jordan Reed? Uh, the first season, Kirk was the starter there. Jordan Reed had 114 targets, 87 catches, 952 yards, and 11 touchdowns. In year two, he only played 12 games, 66 catches, 686 yards, six touchdowns. But you see, his, his, he started getting injured, and then things kind of fell off the rails. But we have a sample size of Kirk Cousins peppering the shit out of his tight end. If you just look at what Hawk did 
in the games where he was the full-time tight end there in Minnesota after coming over from Detroit last year. The dude averaged 9.4 targets per game, 6.6 catches per game. And Jordan uh, Jordan Vanek's a really good follow on Twitter. He does a lot of work and analysis on defenses being in single high coverage versus double high coverage. And he's found some like very predictive statistics in terms of like wide receiver and tight end success versus those types of uh, coverages. He said the Minnesota Vikings are a team that will see a heavy amount of too high coverage with how their offense is built. TJ Hawkinson earned close to a 20% total target share after being traded there midseason. He is Hawkinson's tight end two in 2023. So again, I, I just think I'm, 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 I'm very much a fan of this Minnesota offense, this Minnesota passing offense. It's an offense that I'm going to try to get a bunch of pieces in and uh, and just kind of let them rip with a bad defense. So I like all the pieces there. I like all the pieces that I named today. We'll do a quick recap for you. We had Kirk Cousins. We had Ramondre Stevenson, David Montgomery, T. Higgins, Terry McLaurin, Keenan Allen, Amari Cooper, and TJ Hawkinson. Obviously a lot of like higher name players, but those are dudes that you can feel really, really good about drafting in rounds like three through eight of your fantasy drafts. If you enjoyed the video today, all I ask is that y'all subscribe to the channel. Hit the thumbs up button if you're new. We've also got another YouTube channel, our uh, NFL trivia channel, which is just us hanging around the office doing some trivia. Really, really fun. It's doing really, really well on YouTube right now. So check that out if you want a little bit more of a relaxed feel. You can play along with us as the videos are going on. I love y'all, and I will see you tomorrow. I'm out.